All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you, um, thank you for being here this morning and joining us uh, for this. This is celebrating National Community Development Week, uh, which as the office that administers the Community Development Block Grant for our city is a, a very proud occasion for us to showcase what we're all about. Um, a lot of good things happening here in the city and uh, a lot of positive developments recently in terms of housing, community development work in general. And, um, and so we, we are very proud today to be hosting um, our, our HUD officials from the New England region, uh, including HUD Regional Administrator uh, Juana B. Matias, who's joined us today. Uh, big fan of her work and, uh, and all throughout her career, and it's, it's a real honor to have her as well as uh, the other HUD officials uh, on hand with us today uh, to be part of a, a project tour and, and some discussions and meetings with our service providers. So we're very excited about that. I um, also want to acknowledge uh, Elizabeth Tabzerota from Congressman Keating's office, who isn't able to make it today, but um, we know he's here in spirit. We know his, his staff is here to represent him uh, as well. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the mayor of our city, uh, Mayor John Mitchell, uh, to come up and, and say a few words and, uh, and kick us off this morning. I, I, I just said to Josh, I said, uh, my, my apologies ahead of time. I have to say something about the screen suit. It's that you know, <laughs> it's 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 pretty cool. It's pretty cool, and I'm uh, I don't feel like I'm keeping up sartorially. I have to figure out uh, where I can get one of those. It's not too late. It's not too late. Yeah. Um, anyway, thanks for uh, thanks for coming uh, today, everybody. It's uh, great to um, great to be able to huddle up. Um, spring is in the air. The leaves are. Blooming already, it, it feels like CDPG week. It's out there, uh, it, and so it's um, it's a great occasion to talk about uh, CDPG and home and ESG and a number of. You might as well throw an ARPA in there nowadays as, as well, um, uh, because it's a, it's really a, a, a time for uh, for making some really terrific long term investments in, in the city. And I, I want to thank. Regional Administrator Matias for uh, for her her work and welcome her to New Bedford um, and we will, as we always do we'll make it a memorable experience for you but uh, we've had a very close working relationship with your office over the course of presidential administrations and and your work in the state house uh, really sort of leads seamlessly into your work. In your current job, it's uh, you know this stuff and you live and breathe it, and we appreciate your leadership um, along the way. Um, so it, let me just say a couple of things. So we're at. I, I mentioned I mentioned ARPA in the context of CDBG for a reason, and that is a uh, sort of what I think is sort of a a philosophical shift at the federal level back in the direction of uh, the federal government's. Uh, potentially very constructive role in uh, the life of cities in the United States. So for long after, for after the, in the 50s, especially in the 60s and the 70s, the, the federal government had um, recognized that uh, it could play a role in sustaining cities in many of, it, many of their facets, um, ranging from housing to infrastructure to um, uh, to dealing to schools, to a whole host of things that uh, we do, uh, what city government does, and that cities in general do, and there had been over time, and it culminating really in the the passage of the uh, the, the the legislation that included the community development block grant, uh, which was actually as a point of. Uh, presidential trivia actually passed during the Ford administration. It was ushered through during Nixon and. Nixon had a problem and, and intervened, and uh, as we all know, and then that all, Congress ultimately passed it after uh, Ford was sworn in. And um, but CDBG was sort of maybe the high, the passage of CDBG and the funding levels in the 70s represented maybe the high water mark for federal direct federal aid uh, uh, to cities. And and uh, there has been attacking away from from that kind of involved, that kind of engagement, and it's starting to come back today. Um, CDBG's had a truly strong record um, here in, in New Bedford, and I, uh, the, the best example, I, I think, was, and we've done there's tons of work, and I really appreciate Josh and your teams pulling together um, 
uh, a summary of what we've been doing over the last few years, ranging from the, the work on playgrounds to housing to uh, infrastructure to um, uh, a number of social services, especially in the area of homelessness. Um, but uh, it's been also used when it was at higher funding levels for a whole lot else. It, and the most famous example here in New Bedford was when there was a, effectively a spike in funding in the mid 70s and uh, Mayor Markey at the time was persuaded to put uh, the lion's share, and there was a seven, 13, Lori might remember this, although I'm suggesting you were around then, Lori, but, but um, it was 13 million, you were Jim, yeah, yeah. 13, 13, spent $13 million in 1976 in CDBG funds on the cobblestoning of the historic district. And so I might well say, well, how frivolous is that, right? And uh, he certainly heard it from a lot of folks back then, but you know, again, it's, it, the cities work best when they think long-term, when they invest long-term, and when they realize when, when people in elected positions like mine say, you know what, I might not get the full credit for this while I'm in office, but it's like, it's the right thing to do. So fast forward 40 years now, and we have a downtown, 50 years now, close, um, we have a, a historic district is the most photographed place of in the downtown. It's what people so closely associate with Bedford's brand. It's, uh, yielded restaurants and shops and all kinds of um, goodwill and great amenities uh, for the city and the region, and it paid off in spades. And so, I mentioned I mentioned that because um, there were this has come up in the context of ARPA, right? So, CDBG's uh, funding has waned. The Obama administration, like even Democratic administration, really hadn't gone to bat for it, and then the, it had to be saved during the Trump administration and so forth. But now. You know, with increased federal funding for a whole lot of what we do, um, we're starting to recognize, I think the country's starting to recognize that, yeah, local government, municipal government, does have a really good sense of what's needed. Right? We, we, we're closest to the action. We can appreciate where the needs in our city uh, are, where the opportunities lay as well. Um, we oftentimes don't have, ordinarily don't have the resources to do anything about it. Um, the advent of ARPA and the continued funding of CDBG and some of the other programs that have been supersized of, of later really giving us an opportunity to lay the foundation for a much stronger city over decades. And so we'll see that work. Some of that work is already visible, so it's already playing out. We'll talk a little bit about that today. You'll go to some of the projects that are going on. But, um, but what I hope comes out of this period is not necessarily like as much as I would welcome it, another ARPA bill every couple of years, right? That's not going to happen. But there is, I think, at the end of the day, I think, I, and there will be lots of pushback in Congress about spending federal money locally and all that stuff. But I hope, you know, the verdict is um, at when when you know, the investments are done that the federal government does have a can play a really constructive role in supporting the quality of life of cities, the sustainability of cities. And, um, and we hope that that's not something that just goes, goes away because and it's just sort of chalked up to post pandemic the reaction to the pandemic. We hope that this has really uh, become something, um, become something more permanent, a more permanent shift. So um, I, hope it, I hope it will. I know Congressman Keating uh, was, it certainly feels the same way. We appreciate his support uh, for those efforts. I, I do want to say a couple of other things too. Um, so, uh, and you'll see it's in the tour today, I think you're going to, to the Holy Family uh, project that, that's going to be, uh, that I think is a very useful project using federal funds. Um, I, I, I want to say a little bit about housing as, as well. So, um, so everybody, first of all, as I think everybody here knows, we released a, a housing plan whose depicted there and this sort of summarized there, at least that's the table of contents, that's sort of the pillars of the effort. But I, you know, I want to thank Josh and, and the team here for all of your work, again, for putting that together because it, I think it is a really thoughtful plan that doesn't sort of um, drift in the direction of talking points, right, on either side of the aisle. It's really something that is tailored to New Bedford's needs and aspirations um, based on the data we have at hand, based on 
the experience we have in hand in doing this work, and based, um, based frankly, on uh, the, the experience of a lot of folks in this room and others who couldn't be here today. It's, the foundation of it is that we have, like virtually every major city, uh, ma virtually every city in America, uh, a challenge uh, when it comes to the attainability of housing. Uh, but it plays out very differently in uh, a metro area like ours as opposed to a major metropolitan area where there's you know developers lining up at the door to get in. It's a little bit different here given sort of the levels of rent and uh, the construction costs and so forth, um, as well as the aspirations of the city, all these things and the relationship with our suburbs. What we've tried to do is just to, understand, to say, okay, here's what New Bedford looks like here when it comes to the housing market and here's how we think that we can advance uh, our priorities and the priorities are to ensure that people have attainable people at every level have a, can, can live here in New Bedford and that uh, in order to deal with what is a mismatch of supply and demand here that we are increasing the housing supply and thereby pushing down um, housing prices at, at every level uh, as well that we're making efficient use of land and so forth and that we're removing the barriers to development permitting barriers, zoning barriers, and others. And so that's what this plan lays out, and it's already being executed as, as we speak. Everybody's hard at work at it. Um, trust me on that. Trust Josh on that. Um, but um, the, the point that it also makes, and I think this is an important one, because this is different, it's different from what you might hear in the major metros, which have been dealing with housing shortages, uh, different types of housing shortages for a long period of time, and that is, you know, it really uh, underscores that their regional economy doesn't necessarily sort of neatly fit within the confines of the politically drawn municipal borders, right, drawn 200 years ago, right, and that uh, our housing market is also the housing market of Dartmouth and Fairhaven and, and Freetown and Marion, Rochester and um, Mattapoiset and so forth, and that there has to be some understanding of obligations, right? So the, the rental market here in Greater New Bedford is almost exclusively within the city. There's hardly any rental units once you leave um, the confines of the city, and that has to change. That is a big part of the equation, and it's not to say that we're, you know, we're going to suggest that developers ram down the throats of the, our suburbs projects they don't want, but it's a way of saying this is your problem too. Um, you know, your challenge to, and we're going to work together to, to solve it. And then secondly, that um, that New Bedford's going to do its part. New Bedford is going to be uh, leading the way, as we do on so many other fronts within the region, to ensure that um, you know that that uh, that you know, we're setting the right example for creating housing at every level. And uh, and I and the. Uh, the report, if you haven't seen it, goes goes through that in some detail, but that's that's the gist of, uh, of it. We thought that it made sense to have a comprehensive plan that it tries to address a lot of these needs. Does it address every single conceivable question? No. Is it does it cover a whole lot? Yeah, it does. And and it, I think this is something that we hope, with uh, availability of federal and state resources, had that they were going to be able to advance uh, in the coming years. And so. Um, yeah, we're really excited about it. We're really excited about working uh, with your office uh, on, on this so you, know, you have a lens into what's important here and so forth. And um, you know, we look forward to the work ahead. It's, it's a really exciting time uh, for our city as we look at you know, major development on the waterfront. There's hundreds of millions of dollars of port infrastructure being built here. The offshore wind industry will start in earnest in a matter of weeks uh, in the United States, in New Bedford. And uh, we have passenger rail service that is going to start later this year between New Bedford uh, and Boston. So inner city rail service is moving uh, ahead. That'll be another thing uh, as well. And then there's a whole lot of other great development that's, uh, that's going on. So it's an exciting time. Housing has to be a piece of it. And we're one city. We've got to move ahead uh, together. And that's, uh, that's what we're trying to do. So I thank you for your attention. And it's, it's gonna you guys are going to have a great tour today. And um, you know we look forward to um, you know to, uh, to to getting done what we believe is most important for our residents. Thanks, everybody. Skipping ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um,
I'd like to give the opportunity to our regional administrator, Matthias, uh, to say a few words and, uh, and give her perspective. Thank you, Josh. Good morning, everyone. Well, we can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. They were so kind to get us coffee and treats. I know you guys are very nice. Alpana uh, Matias, Regional Administrator for HUD. It's a true delight and pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, happy Community Development Week. Uh, anytime that I have an opportunity to get out and see how HUD CDBG dollars are being utilized uh, to make a difference uh, in the lives of people who need it most is an opportunity that I don't miss. I want to commend Mayor Mitchell and Josh for your leadership, for your service, and utterly impressed. I've used that word three times this morning since I walked in. I got the opportunity to see your housing plan over a week ago and said, wow, they're taking housing head on, they're taking community development head on, both things go hand in hand. So thank you for your leadership. Um, when you talk about housing and our housing needs, you're implementing a multi-pronged approach here looking at preservation, looking at production at all income levels. Although HUD is in the business of affordable housing, we understand that there is a need for housing at all income levels in our, in our state. And we've seen firsthand how housing is the issue that we need to tackle as a commonwealth. Um, it has to do with our uh, ability to remain competitive in this country, to ensure that we can continue to sustain the workforce needed here in our commonwealth. Um, and to be, you know, a thriving community. So really, thank you for all you do, how you leverage our dollars to really make a difference in the lives of people here in New Bedford and across uh, district lines. I think your point is well taken. It's not just going to be about preservation, production, addressing homelessness. It's also about tackling some tough issues and talking about our history of redlining and thinking about how are we changing zoning so that all communities are doing their part in building mi mixed income development across our commonwealth. So I could not agree more. You know, you started off by thanking me, but I'm really the least important person in this room. Uh, the you don't want me to take that back. <laughs> no, I don't want to take it back. I don't want to take it back. You know, uh, HUD has some incredible public servants, people who have been there for decades. Um, so I'd love for you to join me in really thanking the team that oversees our CBD work here, uh, they called you guys the gold standard, and that's our director, Bob Shemako, uh, Amy and Adam, who oversee our CBD work in uh, HUD New England region. So please join me giving them a round of applause. Because they're there. <laughs> and Josh and Mayor, thank you for convening today. I think we're going to start off the morning by looking at the impact of CBDG dollars, and then we've made this a full day, and we're then going to go and meet with Congressman Keating. Uh, to talk about how are we thinking about our housing ecosystem in this region and making sure all players are part of the conversation, right? We need a blending of financing to ensure that our housing projects can be completed. And so I'm really excited about that conversation because it's going to take the city, the state, the federal government, and our private nonprofit sector partners to really address the fact that we haven't been building housing at the rate we need it to be in the state. And so, thrilled to be here, thrilled to learn more about what you're doing, and I will make sure that I take the best practices I'm seeing here and I'm sharing them widely across the region. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Regional Administrator. We, um, we really value the partnership that we have with, with your office and um, do want to acknowledge uh, Bob Shemako, Rhonda Siciliano, and, and the, the whole HUD team. Uh, our representative, William, who, uh, who wasn't able to make it today because he's out on monitoring elsewhere. Um, we've definitely captured the gold standard comment for all future monitoring relationships, so we will not forget that. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the staff here at the Office of Housing and Community Development. Um, uh, you, you, put it, you put it so eloquently, but, but that's really the way that the work gets done. Uh, our team here uh, does really extraordinary efforts. and. Um, just in introducing uh, you to some of our staff this morning, you kind of see that um, we do things uh, a little differently sometimes uh, to make sure that we get the work done and we're able to work productively with our nonprofit partners and other stakeholders in the community to, to see this work through. Um, there's a, a quick few PowerPoint slides I'd like to go through just in the, in the, in the name of time. We can't visit every site we'd like to show you today, um, but we can, we can show you some pictures. There's a couple of sheets in the back of the room that capture some of our projects. I also, um, while the staff that might be sticking around today would love the idea of having as much pastry to choose from as possible, we have a lot of coffee and pastry back there, so please, I'm not, um, 
it, it's not gonna bother me if you get up and go grab some stuff and, 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 and enjoy it because it's from The Baker, one of our great New Bedford institutions, so enjoy while you're here. Um, we'll go quickly through uh, some of our projects and I, again, I thank the team, Jen Clark, Deputy Director, Lori, uh, Ashley, and, and, and everyone else here for helping put this together, but also for doing the projects behind the slides, right? Um, these are some playgrounds that we did. Uh, the Beauregard Pina Playground, Baby Kenny's uh, Tot Lot, another playground project, uh, both sort of toward the south end of our city. Um, also the Gomes School uh, Park T-Ball Field, um, another, another great effort to improve a, a city park. Harrington Park, another great example. These are all just in recent years, um, all projects that we're very proud of. The city has a very, um, a very forward-thinking approach to parks. And uh, every year, it seems, we're prioritizing a new park or several parks to do. We have a couple in the pipeline to get done now that we're very excited about as well. Uh, Hayden McFadden Playground, another uh, school playground in a, in a neighborhood where um, we've actually talked about this recently, but for many years, it's difficult for the school department to allocate funds to build playgrounds. Uh, but in partnership with our office, we're able to leverage some dollars to make things happen in, in low-income neighborhoods where they might not otherwise occur. Uh, Monty's Park Splash Pad, again, an amenity any city should offer its, its residents, and we're happy to see that one through. Uh, the West End Playgrounds, another example um, as well. Uh, on the housing side of things, uh, the Holy Family Apartments is where we're going to head a little bit later today. Um, this is a, a great project, an adaptive reuse of, of a building that sat vacant for decades. Um, and there's a local connection with, with the developer, a local connection to, to him, and a, a personal meeting went to school there. Um, that, that means that it pulls these things all together and it'll be a real uh, vibrant uh, addition to that neighborhood. Uh, Cliff Tech Phase 2 is, um, like many uh, cities uh, similar to New Bedford, we have sort of an abundance of, of older mill buildings uh, from, from yesteryear, and uh, we've had great success converting those into housing over the years. Um, we've, we've got quite a few of them. Uh, Cliff Tex Phase 2 was taking a, 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 a second portion of a mill uh, that was recently converted into housing a few years before. That project concluded in, in uh, January of 2023. It was kind of on the list as a potential that we'd visit today, but we thought we'd prefer the sort of messy construction over the, um, the, the, the neat completed uh, luxury apartments. They're not luxury apartments, uh, the, but uh, you know, high quality materials. Uh, Jim can speak to the build quality there. It's a project we're very, we're very proud of. Um, Economic development, um, we use funds and work collaboratively with the uh, New Bedford Economic Development Council uh, and their work to empower uh, small businesses in, in the city and to ensure the city's economic engine is running. Um, recently, uh, a few uh, loan programs that they've put together for us, small businesses, the Green Thumb, Salt and Soul, um, and, and others. Um, we've been able to, to blend and braid with ARPA funds for storefront improvements and we've worked collaboratively with the city's ARPA operation to ensure that businesses are, um, are taking full advantage of those resources as well. So um, it's an important area for us. Public facilities. Um, these are both boys and girls club projects spread over a couple different years. Um, they've gotten very good and, and kudos to them for, um, for coming in with a plan and, and understanding you know, what we want to see from these community projects but understanding how how uh, an organization like theirs with a limited budget can, can actually have facilities that meet the needs of their residents and they can be very proud of and, and the, the consumers that, that go into that, those facilities every day um, you know, feel very welcome and feel like they're in a first rate facility. So um, window re renovations, bathroom renovations and, and we're in ongoing conversations about future projects as well. Uh, the Buttonwood Park Senior Center, uh, some, some accessibility work there, uh, fixes to the bathrooms. Uh, this is in, in um, I grew up in that side of the city, I would say the city's flagship park, uh, beautiful area, beautiful uh, zoo uh, connected to that and, and the senior center is a, a staple, everybody in the city has been there uh, for, for something over the years and we're happy to have been attached to that project. Uh, early learning child care playground, uh, another collaboration with, a, with an, uh, an early education um, institution and we were able to help with a, a project there. First Baptist Church, which you can, depending on where you're sitting in the room, you can see out there. Um, the mayor is just itching to tell you that that's where Robert's Rules of Order uh, were formed. Uh, yep. <laughs> uh, so is that a second? Uh, <laughs> um, a, a great place and, and a really fabulous project. You can see, um, I know the lighting in here is a little tough, but uh, you can see sort of the dilapidated condition of this really historic building. And um, if you're on your way out later, you can see uh, how great it looks now and, and what that does to our historic downtown. Um, quite interestingly, the, the, the nonprofit developer working on that project 
um, has a great story to tell about how much money they've received from fans of Robert's Rules of Order. There's a, a cult following out there for that, and, and uh, they've gotten a lot of contributions uh, that way, so it's very cool. Uh, a women's place renovations, again, another building. Uh, it's a historic building that, that was able to leverage funds for, uh, for nonprofit programming, and we're, we're happy about that one as well. Uh, public services, I think, um, so I, before being in this role, uh, this was what was uh, most near and dear to me is, is all the nonprofit programs that, that uh, $20,000 or $30,000 makes all the difference in their ability to operate. And so uh, in FY20 and 21, we supported 21 public service programs, nearly $650,000. Um, the addition of community development block grant money that was allocated uh, in the CARES Act for pandemic relief uh, provided a real infusion of capital that allowed a lot of our projects to go. Um, you will see in one of our stops this morning at the Pace Community Food Center, uh, the way that that funding was utilized uh, in part. So uh, again, a, a really first-rate facility where uh, clients who are uh, receiving a service that's often stigmatized, that people don't usually want to utilize, or they're made to feel less than for utilizing the services of a, of a soup kitchen or a food pantry, um, has been converted into something that resembles a grocery store. People can come in and out at will and pick their own items and have choice and be treated with dignity. And uh, that's what we want to see. It's a really, really a first-class operation. So. Um, 21,600 low to moderate income persons and families uh, benefit from these programs uh, during the two-year period that we, that we discussed. And some, some great pictures here. The Dream Out Loud Center, which is one of our, um, I would say, one of our unheralded programs. I wish their, their programming all happens pretty much after school and weekends and so forth, so we weren't able to include them on the tour. But they do some really great work, and you can check out their, their stuff online. Um, so uh, that's what we've got for you uh, in store today. We can definitely share those project sheets out. Some are copied in the back as well. And, um, and so I, I, I thought before we um, get on the road, we've got a tight schedule. Um, we could just go through the day a little bit for those of you who are joining us for the different stops. So uh, we're departing here in uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so. Uh, over at 11, uh, we will get to uh, the CDBG funded Pace Community Food Center, which is at 477 Park Street. Um, certainly encourage carpooling. Uh, there's ample parking there, but our next stop, not so much. Um, I got a couple seats in the car if anyone's willing to come with me. Uh, after that, we'll be going to the Holy Family Apartments from 1145 to 1215. Uh, we'll be, again, joined by uh, media there to, to capture part of that tour. And then from 1230 to 1:30, we're going to have lunch with homeless services and housing providers over at the New Bedford Housing Authority. I don't think it would be a complete HUD tour without involving uh, our partners at the Housing Authority. So uh, that's what we, we have before us. Um, before we get on with that, um, we do have uh, bathrooms in the back of the building here with some signs pointing that way. And... Um, and uh, again, we'll have to grab some, some pastries. Regional Minister? Yeah, just a quick question. Yeah. I'd love to see the variety in terms of um, how you guys are allocating dollars off small business, housing, you know, what you guys are doing with the nonprofit. How do you, how do you come up with your priority list in terms of how you want to invest the $2.7 million you receive from HUD? Does it change annually? Um, we'd love some insight in terms of like, how you and the mayor have thought about that. So, I mean, as you know, uh, the overall funding for CDBG has been relatively flat for a long time. And so you know, there hasn't been a great deal of variation in the spending priorities. So we have, in fact, very, very little over the last 10 years, right, Jen? So, uh, so a, a fairly large piece of it goes directly to our Economic Development Council, which is the lead economic development agency in the city. It's set up as a nonprofit, but works as sort of a quasi-governmental agency. Uh, a portion of it will go to staffing, obviously, uh, our, this department here. Uh, a portion of it will go to social service agencies, and that's done. It's done on a competitive basis. They have to come in every single year, as, and this is not uncommon, right? And they have to sort of articulate why it is they think they deserve funding you know, in, in, in the next year, right? And so, but that's been relatively, so there's some that have dropped off, and there's some, some that have been added, but the funding levels individually have been more or less the same. And then, uh, and then there are infrastructure very loosely speaking projects that we'll do. Years past we've spent money on things like demolitions and tree planting. We're not doing that so much, uh, haven't been doing that as much more. It's been more playgrounds, it's been more um, capital improvements to things like the 
Boys and Girls Club, right, a couple of years ago, they did the boiler and like like that kind of stuff that, you know, it's hard for a lot of agencies to raise money for. It. So they have, a lot of these agencies have proven track records and they need to come in and, and not just be like, hey, you know, we're, don't you love us, this, that we, we, uh, we deserve some funding. You know, they have to sort of get to come in and say, be very specific in what the funding's going to and how they're performing. We want some level of confidence that they're doing what they have to do. So there's, there's a lot, even though the funding is static, there's a fair, still a fair, we're committed to the accountability. We want to see the performance, and I think we've gotten really good results over, over time. I don't know if you guys have anything. No, that, that summarizes it pretty well, and uh, I, I should put in a plug as well for the ESG home, and we're excited about the home ARP uh, opportunity. Our plan was just approved recently, and um, some of those will allow us to try some new things, um, pilot some programs, and then figure out if we can sustain them through the other funds. I think one of the focuses that I've taken since coming into this role is um, looking at the work of all the nonprofit agencies that we, we fund, and uh, one of the things we wrestle with is, you know, um, is it better to have uh, three dozen small grants or a few larger grants? Um, are there community needs that we almost need to advertise a little bit more? You know, we wish somebody would tackle this problem. Um, so there's some different things that we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at and going into our next uh, five year uh, planning process as well. So um, we're excited for the, the potential for all that and, um, and um, constantly strategizing, so appreciate that. That sounds great, and I'd love to follow up with you guys um, just because you're right, right? When we think about CDB, it is a formula that was created decades and decades ago that hasn't necessarily been looked at. But food for thought in terms of like, could we get communities to engage our congressional delegation um, to think about, you know, if we were going to pull in a lever, whether it was CDB, GEO, home, like where could we pull to get greater investments in the next two to three, four years that can make a really big difference in what you can do in terms of production? or whatever our priority may be. And I think thinking about how communities work together and leverage our delegation is really important. I, I think it, it, it's a program that you know, is so valuable across the country. It's good bipartisan support, but it could use a jolt of, of energy and enthusiasm to, to make that case again. And you know, the mayor, I think, in his comments articulated, you know, ARPA might be the way to say, like, look at what we can do with this. It would be great if we had a similar resource. Mm -hmm. Let's double down on CDBG because you know, in effect, the flat funding over time is a cut. And we've had some of those conversations strategically about, you know, what does our department look like in five years or 10 years? Because we know funding's gonna be flat. So um, the reality is that we have less purchasing power in 2023 than we did in 2013. Even though the dollars are bigger, we're buying less with it. So um, all that's important. And I think that advocacy is great. And you can count on us to be at the table. Yeah, I mean, it's fair to say we do fewer projects than we did 10 years ago. No matter about that. Wow. Um, and we also, uh, but yeah, CDBG would be the more permanent mechanism to sustain the federal connection to the cities that uh, as I was alluding to. I think, and, and, and the, you know, I've been heavily involved in the U.S. Conference of Mayors in my time in office, and the mm -hmm. U.S. Conference of Mayors in particular, as well as the National League of Cities, have really touted CDBG as most of the time. You know, Playing defense, right? Especially during the Trump years, we certainly play defense um, on preserving the program. But I think you know, introducing this concept of well, you know, if like DARPA a lot, the way to sustain that connection between the federal government and American cities is really through CBG and actually going back to you know President Nixon's idea right? because that's where it came out of, right? That's what drove it, among others, right? But that you know, the federal government has a and CDG is the structure that is in place that has worked well, and should, that's that's where we need to uh, to invest more. Excellent. That's the way I see it. Thank you. So uh, before we wrap, I do want to acknowledge uh, Alice Medeiros, uh, representative of Tony Cabral's office. Thank you for joining us, Al. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you, everybody. We will um, we'll conclude here. We'll meet up at the community food center next, and um, we'll be around for a few minutes if anybody has any logistical questions. Thank you to the mayor and, and for everybody for joining us this morning.
wonderful. You know, this is um, mixed income, which I could not agree more with you. We need to make sure our communities are diverse, that we're building communities that have a strong tax base so that kids, uh, public school systems can be funded adequately. And talk about, you know, lending of financing. HUD dollars, our lead grant, state dollars, we have city uh, coming up with ARPA dollars as well. So this is the kind of partnership that we love to kind of spotlight because it's a best practice. And when, you, when you're able to get other partners to the table, you're able to get to completion. So I'm excited to see what it looks like in the inside and look forward to hearing about the groundbreaking. Yeah, yep. we'll have you back. I would, uh, I would just say, you know, in the context of uh, some of the things we've discussed this morning, and um, in building New Bedford, our housing plan that we recently unveiled, this project captures a lot of that. So we know that um, financially it's difficult to attract a lot of uh, housing developers to New Bedford because of the, the economics of doing business here. And so to have local developers, people with the skill set and the expertise and the interest and the care and concern for our community to want to set up shop here. And this really is a labor of love. It is not a, uh, it is not a, a hugely profitable project, but it's one that's going to restore a, a vacant building it's a city with, with very little buildable land uh, in general. We're largely built out. So repurposing and reusing vacant buildings and making the most uh, of the space and the buildings that we have is, is essential. So I, it's a real credit to Colleen, Jerry, the Kavanaugh's, and uh, we're proud to be associated with this project and we can't wait to see it through. We can't wait to see it inside. Yeah, we're excited. Come on right, in. Let's go yeah, in. Right. So I, I have We want our dollars leveraged in a way that's meeting the need in local communities and we know that we're just a part of the solution so to see how the city is leading, yeah. that is the accurate word, leading, yeah. dismantling barriers so that we can get affordable housing and just housing production at all levels to, to be Which is impacted is key. Is key. So housing production at all levels, all I that to people all yeah. the time. And everyone can win, right? You have affordable units, yeah. you've got market rate units for people yes. that don't fall into those income categories, yeah. you've got an accessible unit. Um, you're 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 following the historic preservation guidelines. You're paying homage to the fact that it's a historic. But these things don't have to be in conflict with one another. We can find a way to make. No, it. they should be yeah. in concert with one yeah, another, exactly. right? Our gateway cities for a long time have been taking the brunt right. of the affordable housing production. Yeah. They should be able to have people living in their communities of all incomes. That's going to yeah. have ramifications on our roads, our bridges, our public school Absolutely. systems, and so that should be the the standard and the north star. So love seeing that it's happening here. Yeah.